Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're celebrating the Norton Museum of Art and literally the Norton Museum as a physical entity. I'm Cheryl Brutvan, the Director of Curatorial Affairs and Bailey Curator of Contemporary Art. And I'm joined by friends and colleagues, Michael Burtzell and Bjorn Andersen of Foster and Partners who are intimately involved in making this project happen. We're thrilled and thank you so much for staying up late. We're having cocktails over here, but I know you're nearing your bedtimes there in London. <laughs> this is wonderful, Cheryl. It's like a family reunion, really. <laughs> Lovely. Well, Late night show. Yes. <laughs> that's right. And if you are joining us tonight from the Norton Museum, it's because you're one of our very dearest and most ardent supporters. So we thank you very much for your tremendous support and, and also assistance in making this uh, museum happen. The new Norton is a huge success and we're happy to be able to think about how it got to this point. Um, we will have this uh, session divided into three topics that Michael and Bjorn will lead us through, but you can ask questions throughout. Just use the little chat option at the base of your screen and send those comments or questions to us and we'll grab them at the end of our presentations. But I'd like to start now with um, a quote, actually, because the museum was such a great success. And when we opened in February 2019, I thought one of the really lovely comments was from the Wall Street Journal that suggested the museum was an expansion of subtle sensibility. Foster and Partners um, Enlargement features a light touch that restores the classical spirit of the original building without overwhelming it. And this is something that was really critical in terms of the idea of an original building additions and yet doing something new. And that's something that seems to be a hallmark for Foster and Partners. So Michael, you're I think going to be able to help us understand what this transformation included. Great, thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, a pleasure really to be here since we can't come. It's wonderful to, to use the occasion and, and talk about the North Museum. Um, and you said, you know, going back to the original museum, which we very much did, um, you know, it's a wonderful museum founded in 1941 by the Nortons. Um, when we first came and visited the museum, um, we, we, we as, as you would expect from an architect, you really try to go back to the originals. And so what we did is we built a 3D model of the museum, what we imagined the museum looked like in 1941. So what you see here on the screen at the front is South Dixie Highway, the main through fair, of course, in green, the main protagonist on that through fair, the, the banyan tree. Banyan tree. And uh, to the far end, we see South Olive Avenue and the original entrance here marked with the red arrow, just the, the image you had seen previously. And as a museum, it was interesting. It was organized around the courtyard. And, and the courtyard really played a very important role on many aspects. One, it was a very social place. It was really a hub to meet and greet, to socialize. But also, it played a very important role in terms of the functioning of the museum. The museum in 1941, to our knowledge, was the only museum that was that far south in the Western Hemisphere. Mm. You know, most art museums, most art museums were located further north, and this was the only museum um, fur further south without air conditioning. So what that meant as an art museum without air conditioning, one had to be quite careful in how the museum is ventilated. And you see the colonnade, which is a very historic and very classic uh, device, particularly in the subtropical and tropical climates, you know, the colonnades provide shade. And right. there was a clear sense of access and doorways that allowed sort of cross ventilation through the museum, which was absolutely crucial um, prior to air conditioning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know it, it's that sense of east-west as we know still looking for the, the breeze from the ocean. So very conscientious about that location. Very important. So east to west in particular, as Charles says, from the east you get the breeze coming through. 
Um, and then over time, the museum, this is again, this is the 1941, over time, and this is really, um, this could have not happened what we did without really the foresight of previous, you know, board members and, and, and previous leaders of the museum um, who bought more land. So it was expended and on this land, as the land increased, the museum then had some uh, significant additions in the 1990s and 2003, um, which provided new facilities to the museum. Um, very important for the museum itself is that the entrance moved to the south, you see the arrow. So it was a, a, a consequence of adding additional parking. If you imagine originally in 1941, you would expect a couple of people to drop off on South Olive, you know, the entrance, the scale is very small. People would come in, you know, it was a, um, a very specific, you know, a group audience that would visit a museum. So, um, as the audience increased, additional parking was established to the south and the entrance was moved. And this is actually something that happened with many museums in the US, um, whereby the entrance was moved. And here you see now the new approach, you know, up to 2000, um, uh, in 2010, when we first came to the museum, mm -hmm. that was the first impression of the museum and the first entrance mm -hmm. um, viewpoint. Um, when we, you know, we, we, we carefully looked at the entrance and we quite quickly established with the museum and the directorship and all the board members that there is a real opportunity and the museum articulated that very early on to say, we want to have, uh, you know, we want to have a presence on the main through fare, which is our Dixie Highway. Mm -hmm. And how can we achieve that? How can we have a presence there? And we identified the buildings in red which were relatively new additions, which we removed. Um, we tried to be quite surgical. It's never easy to remove buildings where people, you know, quite rightly spend effort and money and time on. So it's a very, very difficult process to do that. But we felt the opportunity that presents itself by adding a series of new pavilions and re-establishing the original axis in, in the east-west direction, which was so crucial to the museum and to the circulation. Mm -hmm. And we added um, the museum called for an auditorium, a great hall, an educational center, and an exhibition space. So these were four main elements that were established and then unified under one um, large canopy. <laughs> It's wonderful to think of it as under one roof, even though it was so disparate appearing when you first arrived. Um, it turned out in the process, what we learned, um, you know, to misquote Mies van der Rohe, you know, form follows fundraising. We, re we learned, <laughs> you know, we had to, in many ways, the, 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 the pavilions below, they were very clearly articulated, you know, objects and cubes, if you like. Uh -huh. um, and therefore, they could be also easily identifiable and easily, you know, therefore, the hope was that they could be easily funded. But most importantly, um, with that addition, which is um, significant, but in terms of the overall square footage, um, it's not, it, it is more of a transformation than an expansion of the museum. The real expansion happened in the garden. And the garden played an enormous role to say, um, we turn the car park, the museum had additional parking um, since then across Dixie. We turn, the, we turn the car park and the tarmac into a wonderful garden. And the garden is important to say, the, not many museums have the opportunity, not many museums have the land, but the opportunity that brings, that comes with the garden in terms of displaying a different kind of art and having a very different experience altogether, we found very beguiling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here, that is an interesting, we, we looked at the elevation of, that is the South Dixie through fair, the banyan tree. So we looked at the elevation and the transformation and trying to get a sense of a new arrival with these pavilions under one canopy. And the next image, you know, shows really, um, you know, the composition, if you like, from an architectural perspective, we felt 
you know, um, being respectful to the old museum, but also, you know, we try to very much harness the great assets of Florida, which is light, um, which is light, it's the landscape, it's the colors. And therefore the building in many ways is more restrained, is more white, is mm -hmm. more, is more uh, uh, maybe, uh, you know, steps a little bit back. The right. banding was 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 an articulation where we picked up sort of the different um, levels that existed within that building, but also right. a a knot or a reference, if you like. But, to... but you have all the you have, and this image shows it beautifully. You have these extraordinary details that are not, as you say, they're not overwhelming. Um, and one that I've mentioned before, I love how the the roof has this break before it arrives at the, the, the wing. So you have this, this wonderful line, thank you, of light or, or rain or whatever it is that's coming from above. And then again, this feeling of indoor, outdoor, both from being inside the museum and from the exterior, um, as well as this extraordinary cutout around the tree, which I know Bjorn will tell us more about. But um, the, the banding, that lower level of light, it sort of plays off of the idea of light here in Florida. I guess one of my questions has always been, and while you explain this beautifully, is what is that primary challenge when you are integrating old and coming up with something new so that you aren't overwhelming? What is that you know, what was the motivating principle for this particular project, since you've done this kind of um, transformation with older buildings previously and successfully, but what was the primary point of this one did you find as you explored the previous additions? Um, there's really, really, from, from our perspective, there were really two sort of overarching aspects which, 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 we, which we really were concerned with. One was to say, um, you know, we have, to, we have to go back, we have to go back to the 1941. There were additions since then, and one has to be also respectful to these additions, but going back to the original is always a really good starting point because mm -hmm. that was the original intent from the owner, from the architect, Simon Wythe back then. Um, and, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's also, it has a lot to do with respect, but you also learn a lot. Um, as I said, you know, this museum was prior, deceived, uh, conceived prior to air conditioning. You learn a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, the other steps, and maybe there's, I think there's in the next couple of slides, there, there is maybe um, when we go to the inside of the museum, this is of course the new phase of the museum. Right. Um, but if we go to the inside, maybe we can explain it on the next couple of slides. Right. Um, which is that the, there are there were a series of galleries and spaces that were original that you know it was the process of restoring these galleries and right. that was a, um, a a process which we're going to show some examples. There was also the case whereby there were existing spaces that were repurposed, and that was a separate challenge and. In addition, there were new spaces. So you had really three, uh, we tried to identify three different types of challenges or, you know, architecture challenges, how to deal um, with these. And, and that was noted, even one of the other reviews that I read, Witold Rybczynski had this wonderful comment about how successful you maintained an intimate scale despite this kind of grandeur almost on the west side of the building. But he commented uh, in February 2019, when architects design new additions for older museum buildings, frequently the new outshines or simply ignores the old. That is not the case here. The new architecture does not overwhelm the intimate scale that is one of the charms of the Norton. Moreover, the new addition blends seamlessly with the old museum as the visitor moves effortlessly from the entrance area into the galleries. This is partly because the old galleries have been freshened up. And, it, and it's amazing too, because these galleries were so familiar to us that we had been working in, even while the building project was going on, we were installing contemporary and Chinese and modern all on the first floor in that 1941 building. 
And yet it seemed to make perfect sense when it opened up into the west side in this new construction that you had created from this incredible design. So it'd be great to look at some more of those images. If, you, if we go um, to the next slide, that shows the blue outline is the original sort of going back. This is a plan of the current museum, but going back to the original, if you like, inner ring around the courtyard. And if we take one gallery, the Maya gallery, for example, and, you know, what we found, this is the Maya gallery, um, you know, as it looked back when, when, we, um, when we started. And, you know, there, there is a carpet now, you know, the, 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 you know, quite naturally the light fixtures look a little bit tired, maybe Older. a little bit dated, yes. <laughs> you know, there, there's a certain feeling to the space. And in many ways, by peeling back the layers of history, we found and when, there's yeah. also an element of luck with it, you know, but, but just by peeling back all the carpets, we found this beautiful uh, American oak flooring. Right. And that gave us, you know, a great starting point, almost a springboard Mm -hmm. for developing a palette for the museum. Mm -hmm. um, and here you see the same view of the restored museum and you see right. this American oak flooring, you know, and, and it is interesting when you do that, you, you realize because you, you, you feel like you want to do something that is of our time, but is also timeless at the same time. Right. And, but you right. realize going back to the original, it's a good confidence building. You feel on safe ground. This is the mm -hmm. right thing to do. But it was also, as you say, there was a great deal of fortune in that because we, we really didn't know until we peeled back the carpeting mm. whether the floor is going to have to be completely recreated or whether we were going to be lucky, which we were. And, and it was a beautiful pattern that was in already in place and you realize how much effort Mr. Norton put into that original design. And it almost remains a question. I mean, maybe, you know, I would like to ask you, Cheryl, about, you know, I mean, the, the, you know, the sense, what does it mean for a curator to say there is suddenly there are, if you like, original spaces you know, restored, and what does it mean for contemporary art? You know, right. how well, do you it, deal with it? And I think, you know, it was one of those um, questions as well when trying to determine what kind of space do you want for contemporary art? And I think when you have wonderful proportions, you can, you can make art look great. Um, what was interesting is in, during the building project, as we were um, prior to tearing up the carpeting. But when we were in the old footprint, we were in the old building. We were in the 1941 building with exhibitions and with the collection. And it was a pleasure to install art of all, every type of art from the Chinese collection through the present. Um, and, and it was also when we decided what art was going to go where once the building had been and the design had been completed, it was trying to hallmark what is our best known collection in the American and European modern collections. So that idea of integration was partly due to trying to make sense of what the spaces were telling us with what we knew was in the collection. So we did have this great integration of modern European and contemporary in this turning point in the museum. It still exists. I think it's clear in one of the other other spaces as well. You see this beautiful marble floor. I know you were thrilled to find that, Michael and Bjorn. Which, yeah, which again, you know, uh, made us wonder why it was all covered in carpet and, you know, but, but, uh, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's over time people take decisions, you know, and maybe they feel it's the right decision at the time. Yeah. Um, and we have and, to, we we don't know, so we had to honor that as well, unless we were able to embark on such a project as this. <laughs> so maybe on the next category, which is um, more than refurbishing um, and and restoring, is your, if you like, is repurposing, and that's a very interesting one. And in many ways, that's the most challenging one because you are clearly you clearly, um, you have to work within certain parameters. And the next slide shows the original theater. Yes. And 
the theater, you know, was in a space um, that was confined. There was no daylight. You know, the decoration overall was probably questionable. But you, you, you had that sense of you had that space. It had um, evolved over the years, and and amazing, you know, that years. original design that was the 1941 design, and keep the fires alive above the stage, and we certainly made the most of it right up until the building project, which, um, then, you know, the, and Mr. The, Norton the same, thought of it again, <clears throat> that east-west axis and the flow of people through the courtyard to the theater, which over the years had had changed. And then the same view. Um, is now repurposed, is, is, is housing yeah. the modern European collection, the original collection, right, or for yes. uh, of, uh, Ralph North. Yes, it is. And an area that we're very um, thrilled to be able to show off. Many people still, of course, coming to the museum were not aware of the, the real jewels that we have and that Mr. Norton acquired. But as you know, we had a great, um, we had many discussions about this gallery uh, before we were <laughs> arriving at the final appearance of it um, over that time period. And, and uh, I, had, I had really become concerned about the space because I remembered it as the theater. And it was a very, to me, seemed like a daunting space. And knowing the scale of our art that we wanted to include the modern European collection and really showcase it up in front, since this is what you come into from the Great Hall, how could that possibly be in that gallery? So I, I really did start looking at wall colors, which we had many um, conversations about, Michael, didn't we? <laughs> that's a fair statement. And we <laughs> must say, again, we, I mean, that's, the, that's one of the great pleasures of as an architect working, you know, in this case with museums and with curators is you learn a lot, you know, and really what we learned is we, we, we in our mind, we anticipated it should be a light color because there's no natural daylight and it should be a light color. And, and Cheryl and her team really, um, you know, thought you have to look at this. This is a dark color. This is a dark blue. Mm -hmm. It needs to be dark blue because the, 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 the art pieces are, you know, they are domestic scale, if you like. This was Mr. Exactly. Norton's house. It needs to hang together. And, and we realized that the dark color is really the right color. And it, I, I think it's amplified by the fact if you look through to the photo gallery at the far end and you have a light right. gallery again, and it creates right. the sense of, you know, perspective and framing. Um, and yes. yeah, so. It, um, it, it, it it Great felt experience. like a crisis at some points throughout this conversation during the building project and until until the walls <laughs> were painted and we had the art up and and everyone took a deep breath after you all walked through it we were we were happy then <laughs> it was the right decision in the end yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was a gamble too until you do it you really don't know right i mean you have to do yes. things life size you have to paint something you really have to you really have to make it real <laughs> But I'm so glad that you all liked it. <laughs> and this was the other, I mean, impossible space. When I got here, it was even more challenging to work with. But we, we really did try to work with what we had. Um, but there were so many different details and things happening between the floor, the carpeting, the, the directions to the admissions desk. I, this wall in the background was actually a, a very dark purple. I was trying to make that disappear and put Amy Knobel paintings on it. And it was, it, nothing seemed to work. We had later building um, artists projects on that wall, which were a success, but you couldn't quite get rid of the awkwardness of the space, but you managed to figure that out. I think in the next image, it was, um, a lot of wasted space that you made into beautiful gallery space. Um, and especially enjoying, again, this flow, in this case, north-south, not just the east-west that you have in the other part of the building, but here, the north-south to the garden and into the courtyard space that we find in this passageway of the Brown Gallery. But it, you eliminated that cathedral, awkward cathedral-like space um, which was was uh, a, a really 
it helped bring down the scale of the room and also make it a consistent modern looking space. And that leads, which is shown in the next image, that leads to the Harris Gallery, which, which in many ways is, you know, or is certainly the one major new addition. So um, when it then came to a new exhibition space, you know, the, the sort of, you know, the underlying, you know, considerations were really to, again, pick up on the history on the colonnades of the courtyard. In this case, we had colonnades, you see them outside, we introduce colonnades. This, this picture is a, is, is a winter day, so the sun is very low. You wouldn't get more sun, which you don't want to, you wouldn't get more sun into the actual exhibition space than on that particular winter day because of the colonnade. So it's passive shading that mm -hmm. allows, um, if you compare the glass of the museum to many other glasses in Florida, it's, it's a very clear glass. It's not bluish. It allows also right. the shading that the glass mm -hmm. is never does never has to do more than it should do in terms of keeping the solar energy out and protecting wow. the artwork. So it's very clear from that purpose, and that allowed us to to have a good visual connection with the garden, which which was important. Well, and it is that integration of the space that was so critical. And, and what I was going to also mention is that sculpture passageway, Harris Gallery, actually, because that was going to be such a beautiful space and new build in the, the composition and the design, it actually encouraged gifts of art um, from this Shapiro from Milton and Sheila Fine to the Gurgen Sculpture Garden in the background. There were many gifts that came forward um, from several donors and it was in recognition, what a beautiful space. And to this day, people still marvel when they go into this area of the building. And then of course we had to, you know, um, apart from the gallery spaces and, and in addition, very important, we had the Western uh, spine, if you like, and um, very important that there are additional um, um, additional spaces such as the auditorium, the, uh, the great hall, the social space, and the restaurant, which were required by the museum. Mm -hmm. um, this is an image from the auditorium, which is a fantastic facility now having a raked auditorium. Mm -hmm. um, you know, good auditoriums um, attract better speakers, a sense of the great hall with the and pay, the Great um, Hall being this wonderful, versatile space as you, you created. I love the Oculus was also something that came a little bit later into the design, wasn't it? It wasn't right at the beginning, as I remember. It had different it had different shapes in its shapes. form. Yeah. That's right. It came but but late in the design. Extraordinary. And you mentioned before the pay white tapestry, uh, one of the commissions for the museum but sensitively done as she also understood Foster and Partners and worked with you before, but a wonderful um, acknowledgement of using light when, in her case, as a tapestry, it doesn't exist within, but plays off of that idea of the illusion of light. And now this, um... You know, importantly, um, the same space offering a different experience, maybe lowering and hopefully lowering the threshold. You know, um, it's a non ticketed area inviting people in, into the museum, offering, you know, concerts, Sunday brunch, jazz concerts, okay. and it and has a fantastic acoustics. Um, I remember we had the Eschenbach uh, trio in one night playing. Um, and 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 really to to really celebrate um, you know a new focus point of West Palm Beach. Well, it's wonderful to have a community space as the museum is, and you realize that despite the grandeur and the scale, especially when you realize the height of forty some feet inside and outside, it still has this intimacy, which you can see in these images, um, the sunlight coming through this magnificent window, which again was such a, a great um, element within the total design. And you see this other horizontal banding as you find it outside and the, the wonderful circular patterning in the doors, which you see in this great reflection. But it creates, I think also the warm color of the floor as well, um, creates this feeling of, of, of intimacy that 
use surprising, I think. Um, and as you mentioned, the acoustics are, are lovely and it looks like a European concert hall when we had chamber music in it. Even so the chairs, interestingly, the chairs are um, not actually 1941. Chairs are, are from the same year as the museum. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Uh, and they look very, yeah, they look very timeless. And, timeless modernism. And, <laughs> and, and, right. and the garden, uh, of course, and the restaurant leading out to the garden. That was always the centerpiece. Um, from our own experience traveling to, to Florida, we found that there are surprisingly few places where you can sit in, you know, you have the sense of a garden as in a restaurant. So um, yes. we felt what a great opportunity to maybe mm -hmm. create a restaurant that is inside, but also you, you can sit outside. Right, and, and hugely, hugely popular as well, which, which leads us into this idea of the concept of a museum in a garden, which is such a wonderful and unusual way of describing um, a museum. It's such a fortune to be able to have a space and then to have the garden designed by you that has become so much a part of our identity. And Bjorn, you're going to tell us more about how this has transformed what was the parking lot. Yes. It's hard to believe. Thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> yes, it's, it's, uh, I can't believe it's, um, it's what used to be the old tarmac um, yep. area on the south entrance. I mean, it's really, we wanted it to be a celebration of Floridian flora in a way. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is one of my favorite pics uh, with the gambo limbo trunk there in the middle and the elephant ears and the ferns and the, some kids uh, in the background uh, playing in the garden. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have sort of extended uh, uh, the experience of visiting an art museum. Mm -hmm. uh, if you zoom out from uh, the previous image and yeah. go back a couple of years, uh, this would be the vista. Uh, and if you stay in the same uh, viewing uh, point and move forward five years, then uh, two weeks after the opening, uh, it has been quite, quite a transformation. Um, adding, one would argue, a new uh, <clears throat> element to, to the museum. It's impossible. It's like, it's like the Great Hall in that sense of it becoming this space that has versatile uses and meanings. It, it creates shade. It invites people to spend time outside. Uh, it creates this wonderful uh, interplay with architecture and art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I think also it's not only about being outside and being in the garden, but also viewing the garden uh, in terms of uh, the, the museum opening up to its surrounding. Uh, the, before the transformation, the Norton was quite introverted. You sort of, you went inside and you stayed inside. Uh, the intent of, of uh, the transform design is that you have this view corridor, so glimpses of the garden. Uh, throughout your visit uh, to the museum. I think it's a social aspect as well, reaching out to the community. It's so lovely to see uh, kids playing in the garden, as I mentioned, uh, part of your uh, educational program. Uh, a visit to the Norton is really, you know, the kids can have their lunch uh, in, in the garden instead of the school bus. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. And, and in the foreground here, you see the lower level planting. And if I just talk quickly about the layering uh, of, of the planting, what's creating these outdoor spaces is really up to about five feet. Uh, and the, uh, the idea is to create outdoor spaces for art and, and people, uh, but you should still have a visual connection above it. And then the second layer obviously is it's uh, the shade of the trees and the trees do what trees do best, which is uh, creating a cooler uh, environment uh, uh, mm -hmm. under them. And it's a very sustainable uh, approach to building art galleries, one would mm -hmm. say, no, no AC required. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, on a personal note, it was uh, fascinating to, to experience how, how you could purchase such uh, mature trees 
and uh, move them around in Florida. We visited uh, very many local nurseries and we scouted trees from uh, from neighboring lots. Uh, uh, we we even brought over a gumbo limbo from the parking lot. I mean, why should yes. the parking has the have the nice yeah. trees? That's right. In our, <laughs> our temporary housing and our trailers, which many people remember fondly, um, but we were surrounded by the palm trees that you had rescued and taken out of the original parking lot, and and they survived and were replanted and are part of the garden now, which is also um, incredible. I guess that's something you can do in Florida because of the way things grow so well. Certainly not in England yeah. <laughs> or Sweden. Um, yeah, so it created this social short social space where, where really a visit to the Norton is also a visit to, to the outdoors. Uh, and uh, I, I re also really like this image it is showing the, in, uh, the interaction between the art and the landscape and the architecture, how it mm -hmm. frames and how it has this uh, mm -hmm. a conversation with each other. You see the, the, the Gormley uh, statues here uh, in the background. And I remember uh, working with you, Cheryl, and that was an amazing yes. experience yes. Uh, about placing all these <clears throat> The sculptures that all also came in during the design process. Exactly. Yeah. It was again this extraordinary gift of sculpture, not only from the Gergens, but also Jane Holzer, and even finding the beautiful Leger ceramic piece, which mm. is featured through the restaurant, that um, was in the collection that we were able to place uh, outside, as well as move the Joel Shapiro's to a new, a new home. And it was an interesting design concept as you're describing it. Uh, the idea of not only integrating the sculpture within the kind of more open lawn space, but also these independent galleries that you created. Um, so you have this sort of manicured and defined space, but also this openness that allowed uh, the Gormley sculptures to really um, blossom and, and become almost part of the garden. Yeah. So, so the design, design approach was to create these outdoor spaces, yeah. these garden rooms for the individual sculptures and based a bit on, on the size of the sculpture, the character of the sculpture, the placement we worked closely with, with the Norton to, to get the right uh, sculpture in, in, in the right spot. We see here the Ricky uh, and rumor has it, it survived a quite heavy storm lately. Yes, we, we just had Ada come through and it was, it survived 40, 50 mile an hour winds. So it does, Ricky was a great uh, engineer and the, the best thing is to let the sculpture move with nature and not try oh, to stop it. So I it, it did a great, it was, it was enjoying itself during Ada, <laughs> which is now in the West Coast. Ricky moved like never before. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he trimmed the garden around. Yeah, it's like scissors. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Keith Haring, of course, also being sort of focal points in vistas uh, through, throughout exactly. the garden. Right. Uh, and I, I also like this one. It, it shows the, the relationship between the inside sculpture gallery and the sculptures placed uh, in the garden. You're seeing now the Ricky in the foreground and mm -hmm. also how, how the, the garden has been uh, activating the evening mm -hmm. uh, activities, I believe. And it, it has, and, and it's not only um, people who are dining and can enjoy uh, the breeze from the outside, but also that sequencing of sculpture that you have a different experience based on looking in through the window and seeing things lit at night as versus walking close to the sculptures in the Harris Gallery, or being able to walk outside and come upon something and be surprised by it. Or as you showed in one of those earlier photos, the Ugo Rondenone is being mm. like one of the favorite selfie spots in the museum now is right. being able to go outside with those great wonky faces. So it's um, it's been a, a revelation as we've used the garden more and more and and will when we reopen to the public very soon. But it's right. also filled in tremendously from when you were all here and is regularly um, uh, edited because of the growth of the mm. vegetation and the trees. So you'll be thrilled when you see it again, how well it's doing. Can't wait.
Yeah, yeah, we'd love to have you back. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is uh, the banyan tree from from the original 1941 uh, image that we started the the, the deck with, and uh, for a couple of years or rather many years actually during construction and pre-construction it was the most cared for and loved tree I would say in in West yes. Palm Beach. Um, we surveyed the roots, we scanned the trunk of the tree and all the branches and that was a, an immense experience to construct uh, together with nature. It was really a ballet between us and the tree. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you can see this zoom in of, of the canopy roof, how it reflects uh, the banyan tree and how close we, we really are mm -hmm. uh, between nature and, and, and an architecture. And we, we mentioned a hurricane wind forces previously. And this, what you really see from the west, from the west elevation is this very thin canopy 44 feet up uh, in the air. Um, what uh, you don't see is the structure behind it. And that is what really makes it sort of possible in terms of, um, it's a visual trick to create mm -hmm. something that's very, uh, knife sharp, but in in a hurricane wind force right, right. environment. That it's it's firmly anchored, and we hope we don't have to test that ever. But but I know we went through the first year with, um, I think it was Dorian last year. We were, it was very close. It looked like it was going to head into West Palm Beach, and 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 it didn't. <laughs> it's the right. bottom line, but. But again, you were very conscious of that and even answering many questions about what is the engineering and how you can secure something that appears to be so grand and as if it would be a sale. But mm. of course, the way you designed it made it has made it quite secure and impossible for it to to suffer from a storm. It will be the last last thing standing in, in the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so, uh, and, and hopefully the banyan tree as well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, so that is just during construction. I'm up on the scaffolding and it's uh, about half feet. an inch. It's more actually more like a quarter, the, the razor shop uh, edge here. And that is a couple of months after the opening. And uh, rumor has it that the banyan tree is still healthy. It's uh, growing. Thriving. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's doing so well that we have to keep trimming it back as well. So it's doing very well. It's very happy. The people aren't walking all over its roots. It doesn't have the tarmac all over it. Um, so it's 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 just perfect, and the roof is perfect too. But you know, it's amazing because the roof and the way you designed it makes it seem as if it's this formidable yet light. Did you know uh, light? structure did you did you know the material that you were going to use for this element which has become so critical in the total appearance of that was fa facade yes i mean we have we have used it previously and the top layer is a very very high high grade metal european that we uh, obviously imported and we had tailor made for the project uh, mm -hmm. into a sandwich element and then we tested the, what was interesting was that we wanted a reflective material, but not too reflective. Uh, and uh, I think everybody involved in this process remember all the mock-ups and the full-scale mock-ups and uh, uh, everybody being involved. So it was very, very vetted visually and quality-wise. And obviously, it fulfills all sort of the guarantees of uh, upstanding as well th throughout the years. It's beautiful. We make a point of telling people to look up before they enter the building so they can right. <laughs> see the reflection as well. But it is quite spectacular overall. So it's great. Did you have Wonderful. one more image? I think you Yeah, no, I was one. just yes. quickly uh, going to talk about uh, the Oldenburg um, on, in, on the theme of art, architecture, and, and landscape. And here we see it. Uh, hovering on the water feature, above the water feature with the nestle wing in the background and the picture is taken through the roots of, of the banyan tree. Mm -hmm. And that was a wonderful, uh, wonderful gift from, from Ronnie Heyman. Ronnie Heyman, uh, yes. 
and that was such a wonderful collaboration, I think, between Foster and Partners and the museum and the donor. Uh, this is me in the picture for scale comparison, mm -hmm. but we actually went to the original placement of the art piece, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Ronnie Heyman's. Um, in Connecticut in the Northeast. Yes, 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 yes. yes. I remember it was raining. Yes, um, <laughs> I do too. <laughs> yes. Uh, it does but here, it, so. But it was very interesting because Oldenburg apparently sketched some options of this uh, on water. He envisioned it potentially being placed uh, in water. And uh, that was uh, something that the Norman obviously got very interested in. And he actually proposed putting it in the middle of the water feature. Uh, and and that was uh, this is what we see on the screen is one of his idea and, and sketches. May, may, maybe maybe worth pointing out that there were some other artworks which you know um, we considered together with the Norton Museum, but mm -hmm. once we learned about the opportunity for the Oldenburg, I think everybody felt this is really there's no yeah. question. And yeah. I think part of the charm was to say particular for a younger generation, you know, the old Murg is, a, it's called the typewriter eraser, it's the fourth edition. It is, it is something most, you know, certainly the younger generation won't know what a typewriter was, let alone what the was. So yeah. to yeah. have this analog piece, the very analog piece, mm -hmm. actually, uh, you know, um, in front of museum, we, we, we found it very um, appropriate. And, well, I, th I think it's, it's, um, it's hum it's humorous to I think a certain generation yeah. and beyond who know what it is and here it is you know skipping across water and he's blown it up and it's something that was as you say analog that you use but but for those who don't know what it is to me I find it fascinating to hear not only what people suspect it is but also mm. that it's just abstract forms but right. enlivened by that you know those bristles and I know you've got great shots of the installation but it's it's funny how it plays with abstraction and figuration without knowing what it is. And this is to say, you know, in all in our digital world, in all computers, there's nothing like a mock-up. It is in mm. any way. This is this was a fifty dollar plywood painted one to one scale yeah. mock-up right. of the Oldenburg. But it was also our life insurance. You know, it yes. was <laughs> it was too but important. It, Right. And and to get it right. So the the, the, the the real finding the position, you know, um was really done then the final um mm -hmm. with this mock-up. And we, we tried you see the water, we tried to mimic the water with black right plastic, I guess. Um but this is to say one has to see the things and it's a process. It's not right, you know, a sketch is an inspiration, but Yes, you know, to, to actually see it through and really verify it at every step, right? Um, in particular, with those you know, Ronnie mm -hmm. Heyman and people who, who um, are incredibly generous to offer those donations, mm -hmm. you know, that is a real responsibility, and yes, and that responsibility one has to be, you know, it, it's it's the process and these steps that are really right. important. It's, to, it's, it's the give it and work. take, and done with complete respect for not only the, the generosity of the donor, but also the, the respect for the artwork that in fact, it's given this place almost yes. of honor and it, and it looks good. The proportion is perfect with the space that you've created and in relationship with the banyan tree. And of course it's now become one of the signatures for the museum on the beautiful West facade that you've designed. Quite rightly. I don't think New York has an Oldenburg on public display. Oh, that's, I Probably don't know, chess. but we do, we do. And of course, this is, this, we, we're, 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 this is fond memories in, in the cold in December in 2018 that installing this sculpture that each, each of those bristles had to be carefully inserted into this block that had been designed carefully and the way it looks as if they're moving and the wind is what makes it great and it also is what made it difficult to install so that 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 piece had to be positioned at the perfect angle or else it did not go in mm. and we spent one night believing we were going to get it done Bjorn remember and yes. then we had to return the next day and then you brought finally, sandwiches very it was, lovely <laughs> it was a real challenge and then 
it fits beautifully and perfectly and easily once you get it in the right angle. <laughs> And and I think it's one of those things where you can plan a lot, but there's also the unexpected. Some yeah. of the water reflections on, uh, so on 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 the sculpture is really, I find quite stunning. And mm. and we made it in in time for for a great uh, for, for the great call opening, which uh, actually concludes uh, the visual. A oh, wonderful, of this wonderful, discussion. and it's it's. It's lovely to be able to see it from this perspective of, of looking back and seeing the great um, proportions and how everything works together as well as leading you inside. So these, this is wonderful to look back happily at this project. And if we have questions, we're certainly able to pass those on. Um, there is a question, are there, are there examples of other recent museum architecture that you admire? Um, oh, let's see what the rest of that says. And let's see, are there other examples of recent museum architecture you admire and any that may relate to themes of the new Norton, such as the blend of historic and new? Um, can you tell me what other buildings outside of the ones you've done, of course, like the Reichstag and MFA Boston and other places, but where are the, I mean, there are some that probably are not and are, are widely held as not successful, but what about the ones that are, are there other places that you really um, admire? We, we found, yeah, we found in the process, I mean, we referred back to, um, you know, one certainly was the Louisiana Museum north of Copenhagen. Yeah. Um, you know, that's an extraordinary museum that has been growing over time, you know. Um, and again, it's sort of how this museum also relates to the art. It's a fantastic collection, but the, the, the outside, the outdoors, the indoors, we found that very inspiring. Um, you know, there is the uh, Kröller Müller in uh, Appledorn. Oh. Um, which is a very interesting museum. So museums that, you know, we always, um, as reference points, we looked at museum uh, that had also great outdoors, you know, um, certainly we looked at the National Gallery, you know, their garden, um, uh, you know, in terms of scale. And also, um, of course, it's a very, very different setting, but, you know, we, we compared, for example, in scale, the garden of the the museum, the MoMA in New York, you know, just mm -hmm. to see, you know, these, these reference points are quite important in terms of scale and what type yeah. of, um, you know, what type of art experience do we like to offer? It goes back to Guggenheim in Venice and, you know, how is art seen there on the outdoors? So quite mm -hmm. a few. Mm -hmm. um, Bjorn, do you have some, hey, Bjorn, could you also stop sharing the screen that we can see oh. you even bigger? But Let's... are there other, other? Um, it's interesting too, because I know we used the um, reference to the scale of the Museum of Modern Art Sculpture Garden as part of the scale for ours, yet it's that idea of the, the natural landscape and trees that makes it mm. feel completely different. It's totally, like a, totally different. Exotic um, place to get lost in versus um, yes. beyond view spectacle. It's, it's interesting. Not, it's, yeah. Sorry, yeah. No, 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 it's fine. I, we, we really did not rehearse this, but I actually also am a big fan of Luciana north of, of Copenhagen. It's such a wonderful mm -hmm. experience. And I think it's the blend of nature and building that just makes that experience so so mm -hmm. rich and i think in terms of proportion what's interesting also is the great hall the shapiro great hall actually takes cues from uh, you know gallery seven at the royal academy here in london oh, uh, yes. so which is okay. something that was really an inspiration for for that space right right um and of course i love the idea of the oculus i i, I know it, the light is too intense but the I would love for the Oculus to actually let the sun move across the oak floor. It would yeah. be amazing, like in the Pantheon, which you know comes to mind. But it is—it's remarkable that spaces that um, that grand are 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 successful in institutions and museums, and that can be used for a variety okay. of purposes, whether exhibition or or engagement. Um, so. So we're thrilled to have that space. It's been really 
it's been better than even expected, I think. Are there other parts of the building project that you found? I think just one question to close but if, in case we get any others. Um, were there any other aspects of this building project that were distinct besides the, the location? I know you've worked in Miami, but anything else for the Norton Museum that you, sticks with you throughout the process? Something that was surprising that you had to deal with? Um, no, apparently. Rate your silence. <laughs> <No, laughs> <no, laughs> so much. Just like you expected. <laughs> I mean, you know, maybe in Florida you have that, but if you actually have to design for 185 miles per hour, that yeah. is really, in terms of the detailing for every door handle to the outside, for every window frame, mm -hmm. um, it is it is it is it is quite a challenge. It's really something we haven't quite experienced on that scale. And that particular with an art museum where you, you know, where the glass needs to be quite clear and you know, and and so the glass tends to be very thick for that purpose. So in terms of flying objects, in terms of everything, mm. it's really governed by this 185 miles, which is an extraordinary force. And um, Right. You know, we were reminded we had a hurricane halfway through construction, which took a lot of the, That's right. the building yes. was open and, you know, you could see the forces on camera, you know, um, which is so we have a lot of respect for certainly for the wind forces. For nature. Um, you know, yeah. that is clearly a, a very much a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and then to say, and that go, goes back, but also more opportunities than challenges, really. I think we talked about the light. You know the real sense of the people the real excitement i think it was wonderful to work really um and also a sense that a museum is so much needed there in florida you know it's a growing population we talk about mm -hmm. south florida is growing you know clearly culturally there's a lot that can be done to match the expectations you know and i think there was always a sense of a, a real excitement and mm -hmm. um and a very, very personal relationship with those who donate and died the museum. Right. Very special. I, I think also uh, personally, um, what makes this different for me, uh, and very much part of this this region and this area, is the enormous passion and knowledge about gardening and garden design and plant knowledge uh, within the community and within sort of the context mm -hmm. of the museum's friends it's so so amazing it seems uh, uh, like the knowledge base of uh, of that type of uh, sensibility is focused on in west palm, mm. palm. Oh, that's that's nice yeah. but again that opportunity to have a museum in a garden and to and to create both of them so that that was, you know, it seems to be a great pleasure. Yeah. And I, I guess without any other questions, we can say thank you so much for staying up late to spend time with us. It's now dark here in Florida, but we're so thrilled and grateful to you, Michael and Bjorn, for sharing your insights and, and creating this beautiful museum that we're so thrilled to have here in West Palm Beach. Thank you so much. Thank you and thank everybody who listened and thank everybody who really enjoys the museum, who contributed. Um, I think it's a wonderful journey and who knows, there might be one day Something addition. more, yes. Something fun to think about. It would be great. The family needs to get together again. <laughs> yes, yes. We look forward to your return. <laughs> okay. We can't wait. Oh, great. Thank, Thank you, you so much, again. Carol. Thanks for Wonderful. spending time with us. Thank you, everybody. All Bye. Best wishes. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.